Well, it's quite <laughs> exciting to be here. Well, it's lovely to be back in an operating theatre, oh, actually. Yeah, you haven't, uh, you haven't, haven't been here for a while. A few years now. It's nearly four years right. since I uh, stopped operating when I became president of the college. Yeah. And uh, it, it, was, it was a very sudden stop because the last operation I did was just as I also injured my shoulder. And so that all happened. And then after that, I was elected to be president. So I just retired at that stage from operating. Mm. And I don't think I've actually been in a scrub room since then. Really? So Do you miss a, it? What, what are the feelings? Well, it, it's, it's very natural to be back in this environment. Mm. And I think after that length of time as being a surgeon, it, you just, it's like home, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So what made you, way back, I think as a child, decide that you wanted to go down the route of medicine? Or well, my mother always said that I wanted to be a surgeon, or, or a doctor anyway, because when I was about five, I ended up in a, a casualty department having cut my finger. And instead of being miserable, I went round every single person in the waiting room asking what was wrong with them. <laughs> right. And I'd say, a horrible little precocious child. Um, and and, and I, th I think she thought that there was something in that. But I, it wasn't really until I'd done some, some science at school that I... Um, and I'd rejected being an engineer because I thought span bridges would be lovely to design. Uh, and I'd rejected being an accountant because I thought that that sounded pretty boring. I'd better be careful what I say. Yes. <laughs> it's a very good career. Yeah. Um, but not for you. But not for me. Um, and, and then I, I realised that actually I was just incredibly interested in people, what made them tick, what goes wrong with people, uh, about their lives, what they want for themselves. Uh, I wanted to do things that would make them better, like so many people, the, the sort of altruistic intent to do something good. And that was all in a medical career, so that's, that was medicine. An engineer of sorts, an engineer of well, people. Cer cer but certainly in orthopaedics, you are sort of an en engineer, and there's a lot of science and mathematics and things like that. So that was much later on, and then, then I, as I went through my training, I met a, a trainer who was a surgeon who was very inspirational and very inspiring, and I, I, I can really attribute my being a surgeon to his enabling personality and his interest in making it happen for me at a time when really there were almost no women going into the surgical professions. It does, it's, not, it's not that there were no women, but certainly in, in surgery, uh, that was pretty unusual. Far fewer than there are now. Absolutely. Did that feel yeah. odd to you, or did that push you forward, or did you just not even really I, I don't care? think I really noticed. No. Uh, I, I think I, I realised I was alone, the changing room business of actually just knowing that the men all went off into the surgeon's changing room, and I was shuffled off into the ladies' changing room, which was, of course, the nursing staff, which was great. I have some wonderful colleagues and friends. But I was alone as compared to those others, but my colleagues were so lovely, and I just assumed that if they could do it, I could do it, and I just got on with being a surgeon. This, this is quite drying, but yeah. your skin gets used to it. And I think actually, interestingly enough, my nails were rather better in the days when I used to scrub and massage. Really? And, and I noticed after I finished that they started falling to bits. So uh, we'd just come through from the scrub into the operating theatre and our patient would be on the operating table here yeah. and we'd... Uh, get the lights all organized so that they're shining down into the right place. Mm. Nestus would be over there um, with all the anesthetic material sort of in front of them. Yeah. And uh, then around the room, there are a whole range of different bits of equipment, depending on what sort of operation you're going to do. Right. Supposing I was going to do something like an arthroscopy, that's keyhole surgery of the knee, then I'd, this would be um, be in front. Sorry about the noise. There. Uh, <laughs> it's a bit squeaky. Bit, bit squeaky. Right. So would you would and and uh, on there we have got light sources and um, 
we've got television screens and we can uh, we can hook those up to the instruments on the table and I'll, I would be looking at the screen as I was operating because we'd be seeing mm. a beautifully illuminated, magnified uh, picture of either, either in a knee or perhaps if one was doing, uh, a general surgeon was doing something like a, a gallbladder operation again. And everybody in the operating theatre would be able to see what was going on mm. so much better than in the days when I started. You well, li yes. literally, well, how different was it? You literally... <laughs> Uh, in the first days of arthroscopy, held the operating uh, scope to your eye. Right. So apart from the fact that it was quite easy to desterilise it, uh, actually the only person who could see what was going on was, was you. you. <laughs> <laughs> Might have been a good thing. What I was think. that, early 80s? So the arthroscopy was probably around 81, yeah. 82, 83. That's just being introduced from across the pond. And uh, it, was, it was very interesting because some of my bosses were really struggling to get that new technology. And I, re I remember that so well. And it, it's, a, it's a good lesson for as you get more senior, you realize that you've got to get your trainees to teach you the new technology because they're very good at it. Yeah. And so you've got the experience and the wisdom, but they often have the new technology. Yeah, so it takes a whole team. So this is really state of the art. Yes. And as you say, when you first started, it was very different. Do you think there's... Um, a, a greater need now for this sort of equipment. More of us are having to have those sort of hip replacements, knee replacements. Well, I, I think that um, people weren't put up with being right. disabled. So uh, I can remember when I first came to Suffolk, we, we had people who literally were sitting in chairs at home, couldn't go upstairs, and all, they needed two hips, two knees, and they just didn't like to trouble the doctor. And you would be, have a conversation with them, they'd go through two hips and two knees and they'd be back on the farm. So it, it can be transformational. The, the operating lights, uh, the surgeon will have a sterile handle that goes over here and then uh, we could just turn them on and with the sterile handle allows you to get that completely focused in on where you want to have the lights fixed for the operation. And uh, that was, a, that was a, a great advance because in the past you'd have to ask somebody else to come and try and focus the lights while you were operating. And it's never quite as good as right. getting it exactly where you want it. There are lots of jokes between surgeons and anaesthetists about sorting the light out. Right, it's, okay. it's, it's one of those, uh, those great sort of moments. Yeah. Being in here, does it make you want to sort of turn the clock back a few years and start operating again? I was incredibly happy in my active operating life. I, I, um, I always felt very comfortable in operating theatre. When the team is working well and uh, you've really got everybody focused on doing the best thing for the patient, it, it's a wonderful feeling because you've prepared everything, you've got it all planned, everybody knows what they're doing, everybody feels as if they're part of getting that patient a really good outcome mm. and uh, just doing that most days of your life is incredibly fulfilling now you're going to say to me what happens when it doesn't go well and and that is really sometimes quite challenging and for some people as the years go by I think it gets more and more challenging and so one has to recognize that uh, as you get older, you, you, you need to think more to be sure that you've got everything sorted because you know what it's like to have good outcomes mm. and you know what it's like to have not so good outcomes. Mm. Uh, it, it's a big responsibility. So experience really counts for something in this? It, I'm afraid experience does count. I think you, you can get competent at doing an operation, maybe a learning curve of about 50 procedures, and these days you can do those on a simulator. And then when you come to do your first operation for real, there is still a small learning curve, but we know that people learn more quickly if they've already practiced on the simulators. And that's a great advance for surgery. Uh, that were, they weren't available uh, when I came through training. So you'd have your trainer on the other side of the table I can tell you from being a trainer, that's not always comfortable because you're just wondering what the surgeon you're training is going to do. Right. And uh, that's, that's quite uh, anxiety-provoking. Yeah.
Mm. But I, I'm sure it's a process that has to happen, isn't it, if you're going to get great surgeons coming up? Well, I think it's, it's also very, it's a safe way of doing it. You're, the, the trainer is highly experienced mm. and so nothing bad yeah. is going to happen. You yourself said that you are in the position you are now and have had this amazing career uh, because of inspirational leaders, teachers, and, and you are then the, in the position where you're leading other people. Do you think you've, you feel a more responsibility or, or almost a burden that you're female and you've sort of led the way and other people look up to you and maybe even expect more from you? I, I hope that they would just look at me as being a good surgeon and a good teacher and a good trainer. I know there is something about being a visible leader uh, as a woman, and I, I, I know that now, and I haven't really understood just what a difference it could make for some women, and particularly for, for school children. Very often when they come for work experience, or they used to come for work experience, they would just think it was amazing to know that, that a woman could do that job. Mm. So I, I really understand that a lot more than I did maybe in the early stages of my career. But yes, it's a responsibility. Yeah. I think still that there are, I'm, I'm generalising here, but maybe men feel that they can do things, whereas women question more whether they can. So do you feel it's a role to, to not push women forward because it's the best person that gets the job at the end of the day, but to, to make people from a very young age believe that they can be anything they want to be? I, th I think they need to understand that they can be anything that they want to be. And then there are hurdles that we have, hurdles of our own making. Mm -hmm. And I know from some of the work I did at the Royal College of Surgeons, trying to encourage women into leadership positions, that if you ask for people to apply for a job, you'll maybe get 10 men applying, and none of the women who have the same credentials will apply, because they don't see themselves as fitting, or they maybe think their credentials aren't as good. And so one actually has to go to people and say, have you thought of applying? Uh, why would you not apply for this job? You've read the job description, you seem to have all those mm -hmm. skills, why not apply for the job? Or maybe, more importantly, what would it take? What would we need to do because of your family and your other commitments to make this job work for you? And, and that's the difference between some of the men and some of the women. Right. Interesting enough, I think that a lot of the men now would really like to have a bit, bit less of a commitment and, and spend more time with the family. It so uh, it is changing a bit, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. You spent um, three years as president of the Royal College of Surgeon, finishing last year, 2017. Yes, a year ago. What did you set out to achieve, and do you think that you achieved that? I think uh, I achieved many of the things I wanted to achieve at the college. Uh, college. I think that uh, the, the whole business of culture change, ha being comfortable with a woman in leadership, I, some, some of them may not be comfortable with that, but I think on the whole the organisation was much more comfortable with that. I uh, felt that we changed some of the attitudes, uh, maybe brought out some of the unspoken issues that needed to come out. And there, were, well, there was a big programme of change within the college, but certainly going around the country talking to lots of trainees, lots of surgeons, I think that the whole business of a woman in a leadership position in surgery, people were much more comfortable with that at the end. First female president in its 214 year history. Absolutely. Incredible. Yeah. Yes. And you've been made a dame. And I've well. been made a dame. Congratulations. Dame. And uh, you can imagine the number of jokes about pantomime parts <laughs> and various <laughs> other things. So you, there's, there's almost no joke I haven't heard about really? being a dame. Well, but I won't it, give you one of but No, but it's a, it's a lovely honour mm. and uh, I went uh, two weeks ago and Prince Charles gave me my badges and we had a wonderful day at Buckingham Palace and uh, I think it is an extraordinary recognition for doing something that I've just loved doing all my life. Right. What did he say to you? you he asked that? me if I was retired oh, really? <laughs> and then uh, we, uh, actually I'm not sure we're supposed to talk about what he spoke to me are we? Anyway you can have the first okay. bit. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> So four decades now working within the NHS, you must have seen some massive changes. Yes, it sounds terrible to say 40 years, but uh, can you imagine uh, in 40 years ago having decorations on a hospital wall like this? So there have been huge changes in terms of what we provide, how things look, the facilities we've got. This is one of our latest uh, 
really wonderful uh, facility is a day case for our cancer patient yeah. raised by a combination of charitable donations from the public and also from uh, Macmillan so it's a collaboration between hospitals and the public to make sure that we've got the right facilities that's been one of the really big changes but also the treatments we're able to offer yeah. are so different yeah. and not cancer is obviously not my field but in surgery things have changed out of all recognition it's gorgeous actually i think it's going to get quite cool this year. So the NHS is approaching 70 years old, obviously in the media a lot at the moment, um, sometimes for the right reasons, sometimes for the wrong reasons, but um, most people would agree that it's being stretched financially to within an inch of its life. Yes, I, one of the great things about the NHS is we do so much more and we can do so much more, but that presents the challenge of how do you afford doing that much more. And if you look at the number of operations that we do, the number of conditions we now treat that we couldn't treat even 40 years ago, you realize that it could actually absorb a huge amount more of the whole of the budget of the UK. So at some stage, there are going to have to be some really interesting conversations about how, how we afford, how much we afford. But in the short term, of course, the announcement earlier in the week that there would be more coming to the NHS over a sustained period of five years was really welcome. And I, I think realistically we all know that probably we'll have to pay more tax, which was what, what was uh, said at that time. A lot of our hospitals in this region are struggling. Um, most recently the NNN. Um, we have Addenbrooke's that was in special measures. Uh, Peaceborough in financial deficit. There's Queen Alexandra. There's so many hospitals struggling at the moment. I know that you won't necessarily have the answer as to how to <laughs> put it right. But what, what is? There, there's no magic bullet. Uh, but a, a, an ability to plan for the next five years is, is certainly going to be really useful. And actually bringing hospitals together to share things that can be shared and to develop things that can be developed in collaboration with other places means we won't have duplication. Trying to reduce, reduce waste is, is good too. But the challenge will be how do we keep the workforce we've got? How do we attract new people into our workforce in this area of East Anglia? How do we uh, show people that working for the health service is a wonderful way of working and that they can have meaningful, uh, good working lives if they do come and join us and we can train them and they can get skills that will help patients. So those are all things that are really top of mind for people working in the health service. Some of the, or many of our smaller cottage hospitals are closing um, and, and it seems to be that maybe the smaller hospitals are the ones that are, that are doing better. Do you think that was the right thing to do to close uh, I, th I think they could be used in different ways. Right. So it, it's... Um, People want to go home to their own homes if they possibly can do. And trying to have better care in the community and really good services that support that care is one of the issues which is focusing the more generalised organisation. So in this area we're hoping to move to an accountable care organisation where the management of social care and the health service will come together. So instead of there being a competition about who can shift care one way or another, mm. it's, it's going to be, we hope, a much more coordinated approach and help people to get back to their own homes. But undoubtedly, we're going to need beds in the community for people who actually can't ever go home yes. or for the short term use as well. We have Brexit looming. And I know that you have been quoted um, in the press as saying that it's an opportunity, and so let's do the positive, an opportunity to make some good changes. So the, the opportunities for Brexit revolve around the way we manage doctors coming into the country and their, and their qualifications, because in the past we've not been able to test people coming in from the European Union for their language skills in the same way as we could test people coming from outside. And we know that communication is absolutely vital for the medical profession. So there is now an opportunity to do something about that. There's possibly some opportunity to do something about safety and some of the equipment that comes from the European Union. But overall, the other part of the quote, which I think was never really brought out, was that most people working in the health service uh, are concerned 
about the free flow of both nursing staff and other people who support hospitals and how will that work? How will we manage to get doctors coming in from abroad? And I know there's been a recent a relieving of the cap on doctors coming in from abroad. And of course, what about European medicines and things like uh, the nuclear medicines, which are controlled through within the com European community. So I think there's a, a real drive to get those things sorted out as soon as possible so that people can be assured that as Brexit does move ahead, we have all those issues uh, dealt with. So yes, some challenges, but possibly some opportunities as well. Yes. Um, waiting list is something else that's often talked about in the media, um, and they seem to be getting longer. Is it due to more people, as you say, not wanting to feel that they have to put up with pain, or that, that there are more of us, and <laughs> right. that's inevitably just going to keep getting longer? <laughs> there are, uh, waiting list, in a strange kind of way, ought to be a measure of success, because what, what happens in the sense... I'll just rephrase that, actually, if you could leave yeah. that. Yeah. So waiting lists are a reflection of people living longer, being more active, wanting more lifestyle operations, hip replacements, knee replacements, on people who are into their late 80s and 90s who want to remain active in the community. So there's partly that. There's partly the fact that we know that the waiting time has been condensed so that people uh, will be waiting, but maybe not overall waiting as long as they used to be. If you think about 10 years ago, people waiting two, three, four years sometimes for a hip replacement, right. and that's not the case now. Having said all that, they're also a reflection on the pressure within the health service. So waiting times have started to climb again after being at an all-time low a couple of years ago. Obviously, there are financial limitations when it, when it comes to offering surgery. Um, are we seeing more and more that conditions are being placed on patients? You must lose weight, you must stop smoking, and then you will perhaps yes. be offered the so surgery? So, the, the interesting thing is that uh, these arbitrary uh, changes, these arbitrary limits of whether you are a certain weight or whether you stop smoking, um, are something that's been introduced by the commissioning groups. We do know that smoking is bad for you, and wherever possible, we try to get patients to stop smoking before they have surgery. And indeed, in some branches of surgery, uh, smoking is associated with worse outcomes, mm. slower rates of wound healing and all these other issues. We do know that being overweight is bad for you, and so naturally we want people to reach an acceptable level of weight loss if they're going to have their surgery so that they can actually benefit from the surgery ha we have. And we know in some areas, again, if you're massively overweight, wound healing and wound complications uh, are an issue. So from that point of view, it's important for people to get into as good a physical state as they can. But overall, if you are overweight, you will benefit from hip replacements or knee replacements. You get pain relief and you get improvement in your function. It just may not be as good as those people who are less heavy. Mm. People like to complain about the NHS, but they also are very proud of it um, in, in the UK. I presume you're very proud of the I'm NHS and all that it's done. Tremendously proud yeah. of the NHS and everything that it's done. We, do, we treat more people than we ever have done. We do it better. And actually, despite what you read in the press, we actually do it safer. So we are doing a whole lot better. But could we do better? Of course. And that's what everybody who works in the health service wants to do. Where do you see it in 70 years? Will it even exist? I think the health service will continue to exist. The challenges for us will be how do we incorporate the benefits of artificial intelligence, new ways of working, uh, new drugs, new procedures. How do we bring that into the health service and make it work for everybody? And those are going to be the big dis uh, discussions that have to take place to make the very best of the limited amount of money we've got. And people will have to decide in the end how much money they want to pay through their taxes, and that's a discussion for the politicians. Do you think the politicians understand the NHS? I think there are politicians who understand the NHS, uh, but it has tended to be a bit of a, uh, 
a political football mm. because everybody wants to feel that they're doing the best. I think there are plenty of politicians who want to be associated with it, want to be associated with the good news stories, uh, whether they actually understand what it's like day to day, that may vary from day to day. Dame Claire Marks, it's been fascinating talking to you today. Thank you so much. Well, Becky, it's been a delight talking to you, so thank you. <laughs>